The Effenrad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Season 5 of the Effenrad Snowboard Podcast is sponsored by Wired Snowboards, The Boardroom Snowboard Shop, Crow's Nest Barber Shops, Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, B.C., and Anon Optics. We also got support from the three local mountains, Grouse Mountain, Mount Seymour, and Cypress Mountain. Thanks to everyone who supported the show this year. Now, if you're like me and you worked in a shop, you know how big a difference a great rep can make in a brand's ability to sell and grow within the shop. Sales reps curate offerings of brands that are new and fresh or heritage established brands and everything in between. The world of reps looks a lot like a party to a shop rat. They always seem to be whining and dining and they always have a steady supply of next year's stuff. Plus, they sometimes get to choose shop people to ride in snowcats and helicopters, so it's best to be on a rep's good side. I've been talking about doing repisodes for a couple of seasons because reps always have great stories. They're people persons by nature. I've spent countless hours in the presence of great reps at trade shows, at dinners, in industry events, and on hill demos. And Garrett Louie is one of the all-time greats in Canada. As you'll hear, he's responsible for Canada-wide distribution of Soltech, which includes 32 boots and outerwear, Dragon, Stance Socks, and tons of other brands. His story is the best. He's always supported the podcast, and it's an honor to have him on my show. Here's my interview with the great Garrett Louie. So... My dad, uh, my parents were divorced uh, at a young age, so I lived with my I lived with my mom, and I didn't know really what my dad did. It was one of those things like I don't know. He I wasn't interested in what he did because he was into selling ties and menswear. So right. obviously, as a young kid, young teen, it's not like oh I want to get into selling ties and suits <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But um, coincidentally enough, the brand that actually got me excited was one day he got this brand called Maui and Sons which was kind of in the surf vibe. I went to their original store. Right. I think. Venice right. Beach? I'm not sure what the, the store was but it was kind yeah. of the surf vibe was coming up into Canada and he was like hey I've got this brand Maui and Sons and you know as a rep you get the sample set and then you have to sell the sample set. And he didn't know anybody that was young enough to buy these samples. <laughs> yeah. So he was like, can you take this, these to your mom's house and sell these, slang these samples to your friends at school or whatever? So I set up in the garage and, uh, you know, brought kids over and basically ended up selling as much as I could, like maybe half of them. Sure. And because they're all one size and all this shit. And then yep. um, he gave me a, a little check for that. He's like, oh, here you go. Here's some money for that. I, so I think in the blood it was sort of that that started it off and then the other brand that he got right after that was a brand that we just talked about jimmy z or jimmy's unreal right so i was a big christian hosoi fan sick um and uh, he was rocking those pants 24 7 and it was like oh, okay yeah. now i'm interested in what you're doing rad you know that's I mean? sick yeah. did he sell jimmy's or jimmy z to uh like big box stores because i saw that brand when i was probably 13 14 in sudbury ontario like either in Sears or like I don't know, like so one of those big box stores, and I was like, "Well, that wouldn't have been him because we did the West Coast territory, West which Coast. is Winnipeg West. Yeah. So yeah. the big box, if it was Sears or whoever, it would have been done out of the East Coast. Yeah. But at that time, I think it was sort of like California Streets on Lonsdale or Hits Boutique oh, Cal on Streets. Robson, which was Damn. one of the first Vans Hits. dealer. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know those type of little that basement shops. store. That was a yeah. rad. That was a rad spot. So they would do an order for you know like stock the store with a couple of pieces of jimmy's yeah it was it was a little bit before my time so i didn't get involved then the way how how old were you when you sold those that was probably like 14 yeah like just a little kid you're like having your friends from school come over to your garage and see this stuff exactly and some of them were like wow this fits me and it's cool yeah the the way that i jumped into it though was repping another brand so what happened was he had a very small agency it wasn't a big agency was uh, three staff yep. and two of his staff were away and he was out of town and I was around 17 at the time and he said hey look I'm gonna be out of town can you pick up 
our suppliers from the airport, you know, like our, you know, and, and I just got my license. I just got a car, really shitty old Nova. Right. I'm pretty stoked on. Yeah. And um, I didn't know my way around Vancouver very well because I was, grew up in Deep Cove, North Van. Yep. So no GPS back then. I've got a map <laughs> going, okay, I'm going to see Anne from Hits Boutique first, then I'm going to go here, then go there. And I had it all mapped out. He told me to wear a suit and a tie to pick up this manufacturer because, you know, hey, there's suppliers of yours, you should do that. And I pick up these guys from the airport, and it was Chip and Pepper. Like, that was the brand. But we had no idea who really they were. You know, it was just these tie-dye shirts at the time, but I didn't know they were two twin brothers that were 24 years old and wild, wild dudes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I picked these guys up from the airport, and I had a plan to go see all these stores, go to one, two, three, four. And they and it was a beautiful sunny day in Vancouver, and they said, fuck going to stores. Let's go. Let's go find a pool somewhere. Let's go swimming. So I aborted the plan of seeing any stores. <laughs> all I had was boxes, shorts. We had boxes, shorts, and we found some sort of North Van pool to go swim in, like some pool outdoor thing. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we sick, went swimming sick. and aborted that. Yeah. And they go, can you help me sell at the show that was, you know, the no show is where we're at now, but back then it was just a whole sporting goods show. Yep. So you had, and the competition to Chip and Pepper at that time was radical Zulu Airwear, Zulu. West Beach. West so Beach, that, yeah. So that whole thing yeah. was going yeah. on. You it know was what I mean? happening. West Beach was still like a clothing company mostly yeah, at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And these two guys, we were in the booth, and I was selling. I didn't know how to sell. Like, this was my first time. I wasn't officially even trying to work for my dad at this point. He was like, can you pick these guys up? Yeah. And then I ended up helping him. But it was selling... Each tie-dye shirt, each skew that you had, the minimums were 24. You had to buy 24 of these things, and they would come assorted in color. Yep. So every time you're showing a piece, you're buying 24, 24, 24. I ended up, by the end of the show, we had a stack of orders, like a foot tall. Sick. And I showed my dad. I said, oh, I didn't know any different. Yeah. I show him this stuff, and it was over a million dollars of sales within three days. Oh, my God. Okay? Oh, my God. So... Chip and Pepper did not deliver half of these goods. <laughs> yeah, of course not. Of course <laughs> but not. But yeah. he was tripping out. He was like, holy shit, what the hell is going on? So they flew me, and I've never been out of Vancouver before I was 18 years old. Like, I was just here. My parents, as I say, were divorced. It was a, a different childhood growing up, and my dad was on the road a lot. So they flew me for the first trip I've ever flown, you know, to Toronto to do a show there. They flew me to a trip to Montreal to do a show there. And I became their number one sales guy. Right, just from slanging this chip and pepper stuff. It was like crack yeah. at the time. Like to this day, twenty eight years of selling stuff and time bomb and all that, I don't think we've had a brand that was like that where you could just sit ten different buyers from majors to small little independent and they had to buy like each order was probably a minimum of ten, twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> it was so much hype around this. Right. And it was selling like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's basically I kinda did that and then they ended up trying to break into the USA market and when they broke when they tried to do that I went to this Wait, ASR Chip, Chip and Pepper is Canadian? They're out of Winnipeg oh nobody knew that oh my god what? I yeah. thought they were from California a lot of people thought that it's like this surf brand from basically Winnipeg from Winnipeg and, and insane. I think it did 10 million dollars at the peak in Canada which is pretty insane a lot of brands don't do that today right and we're, we're talking about like Nineteen eighty-eight dollars or something. Or yeah, we're, we're talking like you probably like late eighties to early nineties yeah. type vibe. Yeah, that's a lot of money. <laughs> well, they became quite big personalities. Like, well, they were big personalities. Like, they would turn into a room and they were almost like a rock star thing. Like, they did they did music videos on Much Music. They they did children's books later. They did <sighs> little acting stints here and there. So yeah. whenever we'd go around, it was it was just their whole entity in general. Yep. And they yep. influenced quite a few people that people don't know. Like Dove from American Apparel started his blanks, and I think the whole American Apparel business started uh, from Chip and Pepper. That's stuff. pretty but I incredible. I met Dove when he was probably 18 or 19, and he wow. became a pretty big business down there at Huge. American Apparel. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, like massive. Yeah. Big story there with Dove, the way, you know, I, I don't know how he's doing now, but I definitely heard about because he did like a second American Apparel. Yeah, it was called LA Apparel, LA and, I, and I hear that's doing pretty good. good. Yeah, good for him. I mean, he's d uh, not the raddest dude if if your girlfriend is near him, but he's he, he was 
we ended up doing American Imperialism. I know. Well I remember you we did at, that. when it was hot as hell. Yeah. Before so, they had their stores, right? Like just into when they had their stores. Exactly. And yeah. then what happened was they opened their stores and, uh, you know, they basically said, okay, you can't really open any new accounts where there's stores. So <laughs> it, you, as Great. a rep, you're kind of like, oh. okay, well... I guess well, Vancouver's done. <laughs> All these territories <laughs> yeah, were done, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But but it was the USA when Chip and Pepper wanted to break into the USA. Yep. Is when I got into distributing, right? That's because I went to a party down there that influenced and changed my life. Right. And this party was the birth of streetwear. It was they brought the underground club scene of LA to San Diego, which was very surf at the time, so very conservative, plain surf. And here I go to this party that's dudes with dreadlocks DJing baggy clothes streetwear the far side or you know the brand new heavies would be there Dell the funky homo sapien and it was I'm like who threw this party and it was like oh the logo on the flyer is fresh jive yep so I went to go scope it at the show and I saw this clothing that changed my life because it was the craziest raddest graphics they weren't doing rad graphics back then like big bold colorful graphics it was very conservative and uh, I asked the guy at the show, hey, man, I'm from Canada. I rep these lines. Um, can I buy one of your samples at the end of the show? I, I wore the sample back home, and it was one of those shirts that people compliment you 10 times a day going, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that. Rad. And I talked to my dad. I said, look, you've been a rep your whole life. It was a small agency. I found this line that I think I could distribute. You know, it's maybe 10 stores in Canada. Wouldn't be a big commitment. We didn't have a lot of financing to make it happen. Right. I said, yeah, call them up and see what they say. And, of course, they didn't have a distributor. It was a pretty new underground brand. Yeah. And uh, we ended up distributing the brand. But not only that, it started my whole promotional career as well. because That I, early on. That That's early on. That's amazing. Simultaneously. Yeah. The minute that I started Time Bomb... Well, actually, it wasn't called Time Bomb at first because we had partners later on that we had to get because I was doing this by myself on the floor. And that was, we knew the sales and marketing, but the back end logistics, it was like you're flailing trying to do that as the, as the company got bigger. Right. But the very first time, the very first season that I picked up Fresh Jive, I said, I'm going to throw a party like they threw. And that was, uh, I want to say that was like 91. Yep. was my first party and we rented a warehouse and with some friends and 1200 people came to the party oh my god and it became what I didn't know at the time because it wasn't coined but I guess it became Vancouver's first rave they called it but it wasn't there wasn't hats there wasn't whistles and crazy shit it was just normal people like skaters snowboarders fashion heads and I met by doing this party I product placed everybody with fresh jive like the DJs I got to meet that nice. whole scene Sick. And then you're hooking up the stores like, hey, boardroom, here, the staff of all the stores, why don't you come on through every store that we dealt with? So that was a good connection for that. And um, that ended up being pretty cool. So, you know, the one party led to another and so yeah. on and so on. Yeah. I mean, I I knew the story, but hearing it again from you, I've, it's like, that's so rad because you stayed authentic to that all the way through. Like now you own Forch, or part of Fortune, yep. right? which is one of the best clubs in to put it in perspective when drake did his after show he came to your to your venue yeah he, i mean many the, people have performed yeah, there yeah. i mean it's just insane um the the thing was is that i always thought that the party promotion thing was just going to be a part-time thing like i never thought oh this is a full-time thing because i was really interested in starting the distribution and that was my main focus and always has been right and i always thought oh i'll just throw another party and then another but 28 years later <laughs> I'm still doing it yeah. and when I started Fortune which was conceived of it 12 years ago because this is our 10th uh, we're going into our 11th year right now Rad. 2020 Congrats. but when I conceived of it I was ready to retire out of the clubs because I mean you're doing multiple businesses right so every time I'm hustling during the day doing time bomb at night I'm going to bed at 2 in the morning <laughs> yeah, and then dude. getting up again at 9 a.m. To, to work. And I've been running that cycle for 25 plus years. It's been very taxing. Yeah. I, but, but I mean, I didn't know any different, you know? So it was almost like two different lives. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, it was this one like mega life. Because that's what I remember about Pear. Because you and Pear had a great relationship yeah. as like 
right all the way through. Like I can remember having like crazy lines in the boardroom, like LRG or something, yep. which did really well for us, but it was sort of off brand right. from this kind of like surfy, snowboardy yeah. place, but it actually pushed the boardroom into this spot where it could do a more fashion forward, larger space while the, when that was going on. It was like pairs foresight of like, oh yeah, this lifestyle stuff dovetails nicely with you know the technical outerwear and the you know yeah. the, the the and and also like for us at the boardroom us i say i'm not even there anymore for the boardroom at that time there was like we were, we were like dr jekyll and mr hyde like we were boardroom all winter and then we would just flip into a water ski store so like people would come in and be like you don't sell skate? You don't... Where are your snowboards? Like, what, what happened? Did you go out of business? Like, what happened? Right. And as soon as Paris started bringing in shoes especially. So when did you start with the shoes? Well, okay, so it started with Fresh Jive, and that was led to brands that aren't around anymore, like Con Art, which Biggie Smalls used to wear, Pervert, which was out of Miami, really amazing streetwear line, this brand called Anarchic Adjustment, like, really pioneering a lot of streetwear, and then we'd pick up Stussy which is a big brand. Um, so that kind of led to, I want to say our second big brand was Dragon, which we still do today. Rad. So we're very loyal to the brands we pick up. Um, it's still one of the top few goggle brands out there. They do eyewear as well. Yeah. And then from there came Etnies, and it was just Etnies at the time. Yeah. And Etnies was, I want to say it was like five SKUs. Okay. You know, but at the time there were... Vans wasn't really charging like it is now. You know, it was like Airwalk. Yeah, they do up and down, up and down. Like, they, they had had their era, yeah. and then, like, new guys came in and scooped yeah. the, like, new hotness. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so Airwalk was kind of around, and then Etnies came around, which was five SKUs. And then, of course, we grew alongside with Soltech. I mean, it's funny because when I was working back at... Uh, the expo watching the skating back in the days i was taking pictures as a young kid of pierre andre doing the freestyle thing with his short shorts and swatch watches up the arm and all that kind of stuff and then i showed him the picture later because we've been working together i'm probably one of the i mean besides don brown i'm probably the longest employee like partner there that has been there from day one wow right so etnies turned into i don't I don't don't quote me on the exact yeah, yeah, timelines, yeah, but yeah. I mean Etnies, S, America, Sheep was a brand Sheep that was shoes. in the mix, Altamont yeah. and Thirty Two. Yeah. So yeah. we got to see and grow alongside with. Yeah, because those first Thirty Two boots had an E on the side that looked like an Etnies boot. Correct. Like, like I, and I, I was actually that. the rep. Um, yeah. I, I don't rep as much these days. I mean, I'm always selling whatever we have yeah, to yeah, sell, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. as far as the actual Snowboard 32 rep, I was the rep for quite a few years. Right. And his idea was, which was pretty amazing, you know, because nobody was doing it at the time. Like, I have to give it up to Pierre for that because snowboard boots were looking a certain way at one point, but he was the first guy that said, okay, I want, when people are walking around in their snowboard gear, I want them to be looking like they're just wearing shoes. Cool. So he took the Etnies low cut, which was the, the, the E on the side, and yep. it was big, it was bulky, it wasn't the best boot, it didn't have the intuition liners that we have created with them now, but yeah. it was it was pretty legendary at the time to do that. That's a great story, too, is because intuition was Vancouver-based, yep. always has been, actually, yep. and a lot of their stuff was made in Vancouver yep. at, back in those early days, and, and I don't know... How you want to know the story well of how doing. that connected? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, basically, uh, we started putting liners in our boots, but Kevin Sansloan, who I actually went to high school with, nice. and still a buddy, and we ended up now distributing Sandbox through him and all that kind of stuff, cool. so it all went full circle. But he was the one that put us onto it because he was taking out the liners and putting these intuition things in and yeah. heat moldable and all this stuff. And we were at the time going, what the hell is this? But I started doing the same. And Kevin was probably single-handedly the guy that introduced Intuition 232, which they're Amazing. still partners today. Yeah. We still use 32. But there is an Intuition liner that they sell, and it might be a certain way, but 32 and and Intuition together have really amped up the liner. So it's, it's kind of a collabor- yep. collaboration because there's different yeah. levels of them to create the 32 Intuition liner as you see it, which is quite That's amazing. incredible. Yeah. And and I know that the... Yeah, because I, 
I can remember going into Intuition to get liners and seeing just the volume that they had to make to right. to fit the boots all over the place, yeah. right? And and the innovations that happened at Intuition because they partnered with 32, I mean, that, that made the brand. It's which, definitely been yeah. a great partnership. Uh, yeah. I've seen Crystal grow up and <laughs> yeah. Rob back in the days, he would, he would show up at some meetings. But, uh, you know, I mean, there's the shell of a boot, which is one thing. There's a lot of tech that goes into right? that. Right, and, yeah. and that's amazing. But, I mean, the, the liner is a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's boots out there with maybe not, you know, uh, the, the best fits or the best lining inside. So it is a two-part, I would say, equal thing where you need as good of a lining situation as you do the outer shell yeah it's a it's a game changer yeah. for sure once you've heat molded boots properly yeah and there was a there was a time and there were a bunch of companies did some like janky heat mold liners that kind of hurt yeah the the thing it but it actually forced intuition and in 32 to come up with a last where you could take those boots out of the box put them on your foot yeah. they feel good you don't have to heat mold them for sure but then it gives a shop like the boardroom an opportunity to give some customer service that's above and beyond anything else so you go out there on your first day and you've got these heat molded boots to your yeah. feet and you're like oh my god yeah i mean like awesome. you can take eight days to wear in your boots but yeah. if some guys are only going 10 and 12 like why do you want to spend the whole season yeah yeah you know so you can get the best perfect fit by molding it and it only takes 15 minutes like totally. why not do it if you're serious about it but yeah i get it if, you, if you're at the boardroom and it's banging and people are buying boots sitting on the bench you might not have that 15 yeah. although a lot of stores can take that time to sell them some add-on stuff around the store too, yeah right yeah and it's a service that you can do where you buy them buy boots online from whatever company you're not going to get that service from the shop that's exactly it. Yeah. Is that and Boardroom's been doing that with thirty two boots. I mean, those first Peter lines were ninety five. I mean, probably. don't quote me on the dates. Yeah, but so that's twenty five. Wait, is that twenty five years or fifteen years? That's twenty five years. Yeah, twenty five years yeah. of of heat molding intuition liners in thirty two boots. It's it's been awesome. Yeah, like, there's a lot of people in Vancouver and surrounding areas that have comfortable feet because For sure. of Kevin Sansalo. For sure, and I mean, <laughs> I still even use sometimes last like my two seasons ago liners to put in. You know, like I, I minor, don't need mine are ten years old. Yeah, like I don't need I don't want new boots all the no, time. No, I get new shells, yeah. throw my liners, and heat yeah. mold them again. Yeah, I've heat molded my liners probably ten times. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And. I mean, I wouldn't recommend that, but I love mine. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, great. I love them. Every, because you've hooked me up with tons of product over the years. Dragon 32, like, it's always top notch shit. That's the thing. You've got a good eye for it's stuff that's coming down the pipeline. I want to check out that minimum stuff. I, I love the, like, the simplicity of the, like, the, those guys are Danish. I think I called yeah. them one no time. Way. I was like, I do this podcast, and they're like, cool, all right. <laughs> no, anything you need, and I appreciate what you're doing as well. I've been a fan of the show. Thanks, I check man. out lots of episodes as well. Actually, you, you said that at, the, at, the, at the, um, the health and wellness thing that you put on, yeah. which was super dope, dude. That's really yeah, important. Yeah, actually, that was, uh, it was one of your, I mean, it was great to hear the Sean Johnson story, then the Kern story, and then that kind of popped into my head. Uh, you were saying something about Sean uh, that, that I didn't really know some of his past because I, I love Sean and I hadn't kept in touch with him but hearing things and there was something that you guys were talking about about his mental health and that kind of prompted me to call him just to say hey Sean how you doing I heard the podcast and this and that and that prompted us at Fortune Sound doing a mental we called it mental wealth yeah and uh, have Sean speak to the community um, snowboard or uh, nightlife community about mental health issues and that's something that uh i care a, a lot about and it was something and i've i've now connected with sean and we talk every few weeks like yeah. we're really good buds and what we've, a, we've met up lots of times since what an then incredible so i would say that was person. all because of all because <laughs> Thanks, of you and your dude. podcast which yeah. is wild yeah no i really i was talking about it yesterday currents changed the project the trajectory of the podcast and just my life in general yeah like he has a different attitude than anyone i've ever met <laughs> always in my has whole life. Yeah. yeah and he always has that's yeah. the thing too same 
is that he and he's genuinely that guy. Yeah. And if you if you get a chance to uh, ever be in the inner circle of what's going on with Sean Kearns, you're just gonna come out a different person. You're psyched. One hundred percent. Yeah, he's next level, and I think he always has been next level, right? He like has. that's why his stuff was always so forward, and he's always on to new new things. But I'm really happy with. Uh, you know what, what he's doing right now and uh it seems like he's on an awesome path yeah totally totally yeah well thank you so much thank you garrett it's always a every time i see you i'm always psyched yeah thank you as well awesome man Peace. fm rad shout outs this week to garrett louie also to his dad nick louie and then shout outs to all the staff at nla and time bomb trading as well as fortune sound club Come back next week for another episode of the F and Red Snowboard Podcast presented by Vans and brought to you by SIA Productions.